Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, so this is either going to go uh, really well or really, really badly because I am going to be doing some stuff sort of live on stage and it means that the demo gods very definitely have to be with us or it's not going to work too well. Um, first of all, I want to talk about why I'm into this sort of thing. Who remembers their first computer? Or the first computer they got to play with? Wasn't it brilliant? Wasn't your first computer brilliant? You could do all these things on it that you really didn't think were possible before. You know, you could, uh, you're sure, run the programs and stuff that other people had written, but you could write your own, you could make it do things, and uh, it was really exciting. My first computer was really, really brilliant. It had 32K of RAM, it had a 6502 processor, and uh, it had eight colors, or 16 if you count them flashing. Brilliant. And when you wrote a program on it, you could save it to tape or, get this, you could save it to floppy disk, right? And computers today are actually a whole load better, aren't they? You know, I've got a laptop here that I'm doing this presentation on. The reason why it's scaled funny is because the laptop I'm using is terrible. It's so terrible, it's one that my teenage kid threw away because it wasn't capable of running Minecraft anymore. But even my really terrible laptop is literally thousands of times more powerful than that thing. Hundreds of thousands of times more powerful than that thing. And there are computers everywhere, so much so that we don't really notice them anymore. You know, you drove here in a car, well, that's probably got about 100 computers. Um, you've used your phone today, well, that's got um, at least four or five CPUs running different bits of what it's doing. And they're everywhere, they're ubiquitous, and they're ubiquitous to the point that they're not really very interesting anymore, are they? You know, I think that uh, seven-year-old me would be so, so disappointed that there are computers everywhere and they're just so dull, right? So this talk is about trying to make computers brilliant again, right? Can we, can we find some way of, in a computing device that we've got, recapture that excitement that we got from the first computer that we ever used? That's what this talk is all about. Um, so, first of all, disclaimer, um, I'm Mark Goodwin, uh, as I was introduced earlier on. My day job, I'm an application security engineer slash manager. Um, I usually break software, I don't normally build hardware. I have zero qualifications whatsoever in any of this. Um, I'd encourage you to try some of the stuff that I'm talking about today, but I can't promise you won't break things, I can't promise you won't set things on fire. So, obvious disclaimers there, uh, be careful. But what are we talking about? We're talking about robots. What is a robot? Does anyone want to give me an idea of what they think a robot is? A person with no personality. A person with no personality. Uh, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> any other ideas? It's a computer that interacts with its environment, within, with its environment right? With a, with a physical environment. Now, the stuff that we're used to using, our laptops, our phones, whatever, they interact with their physical environment as well, right? If you press a key, it knows that it's happened. If you touch the screen, it knows it's happened. So actually, we're talking about computers that interact with their physical environment in ways that aren't standard. Okay. So I'm going to give you some examples of things that I made that I consider to be robots. Um, my journey here started because one of my kids said, Daddy, I want to build a robot to mow the lawn. And at first I'm like, that's a ridiculous idea. And then I'm like, cool. <laughs> and, and so the, the problem that you've got is you can't just go and buy a lawn mowing robot kit. You can buy the whole thing these days, but you couldn't then. Um, so first I had to get something to make the bits for my lawn mowing robot. So I built a 3D printer, which is kind of in a way also a robot, right? It's a computer controlled thing that moves and does things with a physical environment. Um, I made uh, an incubator for hen's eggs. That's kind of a robot, right? It senses its environment. Um, it's got something that allows you to sense the temperature and the humidity in the environment. It turns on fans to blow moisture. It turns on lamps to heat the eggs. Um, and so that's kind of a robot, isn't it? Um, chicken feeder. Tries to see what sort of chicken's coming along and give it the right sort of food, because chicks have one sort and grown-up chickens have another. Uh, or a chicken door opener thing. If it gets too dark, the door shuts and the chickens are safe inside and Mr. Fox doesn't get them. You'll notice there's a chicken theme here. I like chickens. Um, 
I'm the AppSec robots and chicken guy. Okay, so we're talking about this sort of thing. How can we, from uh, virtually no knowledge, start making machines that do this kind of thing? Okay. Who's written a computer program like that before? Okay, room full of hands. What does it do? Oh, come on, it's an easy one. <laughs> it prints Hello World, right? It's like literally the simplest kind of computer system there is. Well, it's one step removed from the simplest computer system there is. The simplest just exits, right? This one um, outputs a predetermined bit of data and then it exits, right? It says Hello World. Everyone's written something like this in one language or another. So we're going to do the equivalent of Hello World, but in physical computing. And my big idea here, which is probably terrible, uh, but we'll see how it works, is I'm going to make sure that you can see what I'm doing by running the webcam on my laptop. Can everybody see that? Well, you get my belly in glorious, not HD. Okay, but you see here, I've got a thing. It's got some chips, it's a board, it's plugged into the USB port of my computer, and I've put an LED on it, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to make that thing do something. Now, uh, I've got one that I prepared earlier. Here we go. I want something that blinks an LED, and I've got a blink program that I wrote earlier on. Actually, I didn't write it, I ripped it off, it's in the Arduino example set. Um, but I've changed it, okay? I've changed it in a really important way. The the default version of this um, uses pin 13 for the LED. I've changed it to pin 11 for reasons that will become clear later on. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this program. There we go. We're going to tell the Arduino software to upload it. It's compiling the sketch. It's uploading it. And hopefully... If I go back to the camera, we should be able to see that's not working. Of course it's not working. Why is it not working is the question. Ah, because I haven't changed it to the right pin. There we go. As I said, the demo gods really have to be with us, but also I have to not make stupid mistakes like that. And then the lights mean that we can't actually see what's going on. <laughs> okay, take my word for it. That LED is actually going on and off. Maybe if I shade it from the lights. Up a bit. There we go. How about that? So there we go. That is our physical computing Hello World. It's a bit like Hello World in that we're predetermined what it's going to do beforehand. We run it and it just does it. Okay, so far, so meh, right? Um, it's about as exciting as Hello World in that it doesn't do much, and we've not really learned anything yet, have we? So what we're going to do now is we're going to plug in something else. Actually, no, before we do that, we're going to have a look at what it is that we just made. We've got our single board computer here. We've wired something into one of the GPIO pins. GPIO means general purpose I.O., and we've run a program that makes that LED flash. Okay, what does this program do? Come on, someone must know. It's a question and answer thing. It says, what's your name? And when you enter your name, it sends it back to you. Hello, whatever. So if you put your name B-Sides Newcastle, it'll say, hello, B-Sides Newcastle. Okay, so we're going to do the... Uh, physical computing version of this. What we're going to do is we're going to add some input to our program, to our system, and then we're going to make stuff happen with that input. And the input we're going to add is a switch. Okay, I've got a little button here. If I go back to, to cheese, you can see we've got a button. And I'm going to connect that button to one of the GPO pins on the Arduino, and hopefully um, it will register the fact that the button's been pressed. Now, before, it just looped, turning a light on and off, and it kept the frequency of that the same the whole time. What it's going to do this time is when it detects that the button's been pressed, it's going to halve the amount of time between it turning the light on and off. Okay. Um, now, there's a little detail here. 
that I want you to look at. You'll notice that I've put a little resistor here between the switch input and the ground. This is because of a little detail of the way that analog inputs work on um, GPIO pins. Um, if you don't make sure that it's pulled to either um, the um, control voltage or to ground, it's not actually defined what voltage that input is. Okay, so it might be that when you close the switch, it goes to five volts and the Arduino can read it, or it might be that you get sort of random input. Um, some devices have automagic pull down or pull up uh, features in them. This one doesn't, and so we've put a resistor in. So we've got a resistor, we've got a switch, and we're gonna plug it all in, run the software, and see if it works. Okay, so first step, we need some code. This time we're going to open a digital I.O. project. There we go. And to talk you through what's happening here, we're setting up two different pins on the Arduino. We're setting up pin 13 for the LED and pin 8 for the button. We're choosing a delay time of 1024 rather than 1000 because 1024 divides by 2 really conveniently. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're running a loop Every time we go around the loop, if the button's being pressed, we're going to halve the delay time. So we'll start off with flash on, flash off, roughly once a second. If we press the switch, that's going to speed up. If we press the switch again, it's going to speed up some more. So we need to put our button on to pin number 8 of our Arduino. Let's do that now. Pin number 8 is here, and we needed to put... The control voltage, so I plug that into 5 volts on the Arduino, and a ground as well. So I plug that into ground. So what you can see now if you look at the Arduino is there's a bunch of wires coming out of it. And the grey and the purple one are for the LED that we already had. The others are all about making this switch sit in place. Okay, and then we can go back to our project. We can run the code. And there's a bug in line 31. Oh, this is just because I haven't got space here, so I'm kind of putting this stuff together on the keyboard, which makes for interesting input. There we go. So it says it's compiled it, it says it's uploaded it, and now if we go back, so far it should look exactly the same because the LED should be going on and off again, except it isn't because I didn't upload, I didn't change the GPIO back to 11. There's a reason why I changed this pin. It all become clear in a bit, honestly. There we go. So now, can you see that going on and off? Okay, now if I press the button, can you see that going on and off faster? Nope. There you go, on, off, on, off, on, off. And if I keep on pressing it, it starts going really, 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 really fast until actually it's just sort of dimly on rather than flashing on and off. Any idea why it looks sort of dimly on? Anyone got any ideas on that? Yeah, so it hasn't got time to power down completely. Or, or Possibly more accurately, it's turning on and off. It's just happening so fast that you can't see it. Okay, so that's what's going on there. Now, this is a really good point for us to start thinking about something that's really useful in building robots and things. We're going to talk about a thing called pulse width, width modulation because um, we've looked at digital input and output where we've got an LED that's either on or off and um, digital input where we've got a switch that's either on or off. Um, but we want to move to things that are varying degrees of on or off. And obviously computers are digital machines, right? When you're doing something in a computer and it looks like you've got an analog input or an analog output, it's fooling you in some way, right? And pulse width modulation is how a computer fools you into giving you an, an analog output. What happens is, is it will give you pulses at a particular frequency and how much on there is compared to how much off there is tells you how on the thing that you're controlling is. 
And so that first case there is just like the LED that we had on our example there, where it's on half the time and off half the time. So it's sort of half on. This one here would be almost all on because it's on most of the time and only off a tiny bit of the time. And this one here is almost all off. Now, um, this is useful for us because it means that we can take things like motors or actually LEDs. You can change the brightness of an LED using this, this technique. Um, and it allows us to, to, to vary the amount of power that goes to that device, which is really useful if you're powering um, motors and stuff. Okay, so um, we're going to do a bit of this now. We're going to take out Arduino again. This time we're going to add a different input. We used a digital input before on pin 8. This time we're going to use an analog input and we're going to put a potentiometer on there. So a potentiometer is just a, a resistor, big resistor between its outer two legs. And then when you turn the uh, little knob in the middle, let's turn it back to the camera so you can see what's going on. When I turn this here, it changes whereabouts on the resistance material the, um, uh, the contact is so that you get a varying amount of um, the voltage across the outer pins. It's kind of shown in the diagram there. You've got the 5 volt side, the ground side, and this moves up and down as you turn the uh, little dial. So we're going to plug that in, and then we're going to try running another program, which we'll talk through before we actually start making use of it. So this time, again, I'm plugging in to 5 volts and ground so that I've got a known voltage across the potentiometer. 5 volts and ground. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug the final lead into the analog input. And now we're going to talk about code. So here we go. We've got um, the analog input there with a yellow lead as per the diagram that we saw here. OK, so let's look at some code. We go to our sketchbook and I've got an analog I.O. project. And what's happening here is every time the loop is running, oh, so I set up an LED first, analog LED on pin 11. That's why I changed the pin on the previous examples. And we'll have a loop. And every time the loop runs, we're taking a sensor value from the analog input and we are setting the LED to be that value divided by four. Now, the reason why we've got a magic number four there is that when you are um, writing to one of the PWM pins on an Arduino, it takes a value from 0 to 255. When you're reading an analog value, it takes a 10-bit value, so it can be from 0 to 1024. So we just divide it by 4 because it's hacky maths and it works. We upload it, we run our program, and then this time what happens is, if we go back to cheese, and see what's going on on the camera. Um, I should put something over the screen, shouldn't I? Then we could uh, see that without. There we go. I can turn it all the way up. We've got maximum brightness. I can turn it all the way down where it's basically off, or I can put it somewhere in between. Okay. And whatever I do to the potentiometer here is reflected in what happens to that LED. Okay, so lovely. We've, we've managed to deal with things that do input, analog and digital. We've done things that do input, uh, we've done things that do output, analog and digital. Now, this is a good point to talk about which of the many kinds of little boards with lots of chips on that you should use for this kind of thing. Um, who's got a Raspberry Pi here? Okay, so Raspberry Pis are. Um, one of a number of single board computers that are basically full-fledged computers in a small form factor, right? You run regular Linux on your Raspberry Pi, it's ARM Linux, but it does have um, a few little nice things for building this sort of thing. It has uh, GPIO ports, it has a couple of PWM outputs and things. Um, the thing I'm using here in Arduino is a purpose-made um, microcontroller prototyping board, um, and that contains something that's far less powerful uh, is less like a, a general purpose computer, but because of that actually makes it a little bit easier to get up and running in, in the initial case. 
And, and I think that which you use really depends on what your application is going to be. Um, if you've got a microcontroller board, typically the advantages are it's easier for you to run the program the first time. And, and you know, when you, when you turn the thing on, your program is running straight from the outset. You don't need to figure out how to sort out your initialization scripts on your Linux installation to get your code running. Um, you get uh, real-time processing because it's got a single thread. Um, you've got lots of I.O. options. You've got um, six analog input ports, whereas a Raspberry Pi would have none, and so on and so forth. Single board computers have a different set of advantages. They have um, support for many more different kinds of input and output. So, for example, a Raspberry Pi has a camera. It knows how to do sound. Um, it has a full operating system, which means that you get things built in that um, allow you to do things like networking and so on and so forth. And it'll allow you to support more language as well. Um, and Arduino, you've basically got a choice of, of C, C++. Some of the newer microcontroller boards, you can use Rust, and that's great. And then you've got things like the Esprino, which allow you to run JavaScript. But for the most part, microcontrollers, you're fairly restricted. Now, I often use both, uh, sometimes on the same project. Um, so the ones we saw earlier on, the... Um, thing for opening and closing the chicken coop door, that's just an Arduino because it doesn't need to be clever. The uh, green robot, that needs the I.O. features that the Arduino has, but it also needs a bigger brain than a microcontroller can have. So I have a, a fully-fledged computer on there as well as um, a machine that does the I.O. Um, other examples, the incubator for hatching the eggs, that was just a Raspberry Pi because I just needed simple input and output. Um, and yeah, sometimes I use both. So we'll get into a little bit more detail about that later on. Now, before we move on to um, actually building a robot, um, I just want to, to make a point about analog outputs. Um, when you are taking an output from a microcontroller board or a Raspberry Pi or something like that, Typically, it will give you a voltage, right? The voltage will give you some information what it is that you're outputting, but it won't drive much current, which means that if you want to run a, a battery or something, it's not going to work. And even if the voltage is matched, the current wouldn't. And in many cases, when you're doing something that requires real movement, you're going to want to, to drive a higher voltage on the battery than you would otherwise. Um, and so there are a bunch of things that can make this sort of thing easier. Um, one thing that's really useful to learn about is a thing called an H-bridge driver. This does two things for you. The first is, is it had, has the sort of digital amplification stuff built in that allows you to, to boost the voltage and current to what your motor needs. The other thing that it allows you to do is to swap the inputs on your DC motor so that um, you can drive it one way or another way without having to worry about which leads connected to what. So it allows bidirectional control of two DC motors or this particular one, which I think is an L298 or something, allows you to drive one stepper motor. But you don't need to worry about stepper motors yet. So we're going to be using one of these in a bit. Um, so apologies for the next bit. We're going from some basic uh, input and output stuff to something that's a little bit more complicated. And um, I don't want you to despair too much about drawing the rest of the L, because actually everything in what you're about to see is something that you've already seen. Um, before we do, though, I've got another um, spin on the example that we've just looked at. So we had the analog LED thing. We've looked at basic digital I.O. We've looked at basic analog I.O. I want to talk about one more kind of input-output that's really, really useful. And that is that whilst you're um, familiar now with the idea of reading or writing a bit for digital I.O., you'll be aware that there are sort of higher-level digital protocols that allow you to do things a bit more clever with digital communications between two devices, right? So you'll know, for example, that you can have a serial connection between two machines. In terms of the um, electronics of what's going on, you've just got IO pins um, reading and writing digital bits on a wire. But in terms of what you see as a programmer, it's all a bit easier. So serial is one example. Another example would be the uh, Philips I squared C bus. Um, there might be other, other things like that. You know, going high level, you have things like networking or whatever. And we're going to make use of one of these high level protocols by talking to the program that we've just written um, over the serial port. So it looks pretty much the same as it did before, except we're initializing some stuff for our serial input output. We're setting up the analog LED as we did before. 
we're setting a speed on our serial port. We're reading the sensor value the same as we did before. We've got something that does a bit with this based on some value which we haven't talked about yet. I've got a reversed value there. And then what we do is we read from the serial port and we look for a command. If the line has show, we're going to show what the sensor value is to the serial port. If it starts with reverse, we're going to change how that, that sensor value is interpreted. Okay, And now we're going to run it, put it onto our Arduino. That's uploading. It's working now. And initially, it's going to look exactly the same as it did before. We go to our, um, go to show it off on the camera. There we go. You can see that that's on at the moment. If I turn down the brightness, it goes darker. If I turn up the brightness, it goes brighter. But now what we're going to do is we're going to interact with it in a different way. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to start a serial connection to the Arduino that's running, and we're going to send it a command. Remember, one of them was show. If I run that command, it tells us that at the moment the analog input is 1,023. If I turn it down a bit, nothing happens, but it should. <laughs> there we go. The demo gods have given up on us. Well, it's, it's showing us something which is nice, at least, I suppose. Um, Okay, um, there's a bug in there somewhere. I can't be bothered to find it. Um, but the other thing we can do is we can send it a command to reverse. And then when it receives that, what it's going to do... Oh, there we go. It says it's zero now. When we tell it to reverse, this time, when the potentiometer is turned all the way down, the light is fully on. And if I turn it up, it turns off. So we've completely changed the behavior of our program by sending it a command over one of these high-level communication mechanisms. Okay, so there we have it. We've got analog I.O., we've got a higher level sort of digital I.O., and we've seen the low level digital I.O. as well. So let's move on to our more complicated thing. We've got the Arduino that we saw before, and whereas before we had one analog output that controlled how bright an LED was, what we're going to do this time is we're going to have four analog outputs that tell you um, how fast a motor has to go in a particular direction. Okay, The way that this H-bridge driver works is it's got four input pins here which tell you um, whether it's meant to go a particular speed in one direction, a particular speed in another direction, or the same for the other channel. right? So we've got two motors here, and these four lines from the Arduino are controlling how fast the motor goes in a particular direction. And then what we've got is we've got a serial port connected to the uh, piece of hardware we haven't introduced yet, which is just... I need to find that or the demo is not going to work very well. Uh, it's here somewhere. Oh, there we go. Here we go. This is a, uh, a Bluetooth to serial adapter, right? And so what we can do is we can plug in this Bluetooth to serial adapter. We can plug in our H-bridge driver, which has got motors attached to it. We can plug it into a battery. And if we've done all the plugging in right, and that's a big if, um, we should be able to control it with something, right? Now, has anyone ever driven a bulldozer or anything before? A tracked vehicle? It's fun, right? Yeah? But what input do you need to drive a bulldozer? You have sticks normally, don't you, which control the speeds of the um, the different tracks. Um, I thought what would be really nice is if you could drive a track vehicle with one finger. So what I've done is I've written a program for my phone that talks via Bluetooth to something, the robot in this case, and tells it where I'm touching on the screen. And if I'm touching to the sides of the screen, it'll tell the robot to turn. And if I'm touching at the top or the bottom of the screen, it'll tell the robot to go forwards or backwards. So we're using the phone as a sensor, essentially. And this, this idea will be important later on. So let's put this thing together. 
this is where we're most likely to have a problem, in my humble opinion. This is where it's all going to go horribly wrong. So you can either wish me luck or catastrophe, depending on your disposition. Before I do anything else, though, I'm going to upload the software that runs this thing to the Arduino. Um, it really isn't very complicated, by the way, this, this code. So we'll talk, talk it through ever so quickly once we've got the thing moving. Um, so that's there. Upload it. It's uploaded. And I've got a picture of where I put the GPIO pins last time I did this. So hopefully everything should go okay, he says. So remember, we need to... Oop, that's the wrong picture. First of all, plug in some power. Um, turns out my brain's doing the GPIO pins first, so let's just go with that. Pin three, pin five. You know how it's really hard typing when someone's watching you? Have you ever tried putting wires into something? It's not easy. There we go. So now what I've done is I've connected all of the wires that I need for the motor driver inputs. Now I need some power for my um, Arduino. So I plug that in here. But I'm also going to need some power for my Bluetooth receiver, so I'm going to have to do some jamming things in. What did I do with the Bluetooth receiver? Oh, there it is. So I want the yellow cable. I don't want the green cable to go in with the 5 volts there. So somebody who did this properly would have a breadboard where everything was nicely broken out, rather than trying to hack it by shoving things in on a platform, but that's not me. That's not how we roll. Okay, so now I need ground, which is yellow. Ground is yellow. And I need to plug in the serial leads, which I think are here. Okay, so now I'll hold it up for the camera. I've got the Arduino sat on the chassis with what looks to be wires going into all the right places. We're going to want another ground lead there. Let's plug that one in. And then any luck, if I stick this out of the way, push that battery in, Yay, lights have come on. That's always a good sign when lights come on. And I can run my program again. I tell it that I want to connect. It says, do I want to touch with, do I want to connect with that Bluetooth adapter? And I say, yes. What do you reckon? Is it going to work? Hey. So there we go. You can just, Steer that around. Anyone want to go? <laughs> there we go. Don't put all my messages on the internet. There you go, it's quite intuitive, isn't it? So we turned our phone into a sensor for our robot. And this is one of the cool things about making use of different devices in what you're building. Because actually phones are pretty cool. They've got accelerometers, they've got GPSs, they've got touch screens, they've got cameras, they've got all that sort of stuff. And um, that makes them really useful. Which leads me on to another slide, which is this one here. A few years back, um, when I worked at Mozilla, we were building a phone operating system. And um, security work on phone stuff isn't always thrilling. So when you get an opportunity to do something that isn't security stuff, it, it can be fun. So I made a... Uh, program on the phone which used WebRTC, which is the web technology that allows you, allows you to do video conferencing in your browser, to sit on a robot chassis 
and work as a virtual telepresence robot. And uh, that's me and my kid uh, showing it off. And that was good fun. Now, the robot I've just shown you um, is made from a thing that I bought on Amazon. It was 10.99, but the motors were rubbish, so I replaced them. And um, actually, the whole thing was rubbish, so I've cut most of it out, and I've, I've sort of um, jammed bits back in, and it works all right, yeah? The thing is that you're probably not, if you're sort of first getting into this kind of thing, you're probably not willing to spend money on things to throw them away um, or to break them up or whatever. And so what I wanted to do was come up with a way of making this a little bit more accessible to people that didn't want to break things um, just to get something working. And this brings me on to the final bit, um, which is this. Um, there's an event in Birmingham called Fusion. It's a pretty good meetup. Um, whereas you'll often have like a developer meetup or a QA meetup or a, a designers meetup, Fusion is a bit of everything. And I sometimes go along to do security talks. And I got a call from um, Hannah Mitchell, the person that organizes it one day, saying, we've got an AI day and we need someone to build a robot. Can you do that for us? Okay, fine. Um, so I, I set off, I went to Toys R Us and bought that. And then on the train, I hacked it to do stuff. So this is a little bit of very, very rudimentary reverse engineering. So you take the thing apart. What happens is you have a little remote control. Let's get the camera out because I've got one somewhere. Uh, I'm sure I've got one somewhere. Just put this here. Don't fall off. There we go. Little remote control. It's got two little um, levers on it. Um, they're either on or off. You don't get proportional control, which is a real shame. Um, and that talks to a receiver, which is here, which in turn drives some motors. That's the wrong window. Here we go. And the motors drive the tracks. So I thought, well, there can't be anything too magic happening here. Uh, let's figure out how this is actually working. And you can indeed figure out how it's working. Um, you get these little special bricks here when you're using Lego power functions. Uh, here's one of these little bricks here. Looks a bit like a robot face, doesn't it? Hello. Um, and um, I worked out how the connecting up works because the the battery packs you get, you, you can plug a motor into them directly and it can go one way or another, or you can turn it off. Um, and yet you can also plug things that aren't um, directional or intermittently controlled. So there had to be two lines that were... Um, providing a voltage and a ground permanently, and then the other two switching over. And indeed, that is the case. You can see here we've got the four little contacts. That's ground always. That's five volts always. And then what these two are depends on what's going on with the controller. And so what I did was I took this, oh, I took this and did that to it so that I have exactly the same software, exactly the same type of board, um, and I got two spare leads off eBay that allowed me to butcher just enough to get the Lego toy working using our custom control stuff. Okay, so bear in mind the original version, it works, right? But it doesn't allow you to do proportional control and stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to see whether we can get exactly the same phone app and exactly the same robot software to work with Lego. So I'll need my app running again. This, sh this one should work fine because I literally haven't touched it since it was working this morning. And of course, that's why it isn't. Oh, there we go. There we go. So off the shelf Lego toy. I haven't broken it at all. Um, and it means that if you want to get trying some of this stuff, you can do so without any risk to eBay purchases, or other things like that. So there we go. That is how to build a robot for complete beginners. Uh, any questions? I can't see. If you've got questions, I can't see you anyway. Hello, hello, hello. I'm reasonably safe. It's not going to be my overlord by the end of the day. <laughs> Maybe. 
If we could attach a leaf blower to it, though, and chase Scott McGreevy around the place. Absolutely, it's got to be done. If you could put a like harness on it or something like that, we could maybe get Scott out of the escalator he's trapped in. We'd well, so in. the first version of this, as I said before, was um, as a result of my kids saying, can we build a robot to mow the lawn? So I put a lithium-ion-powered strimmer head on the robot base, and that's what, what could go did. wrong. Well, you know, spinning blades of death, small children. <laughs> so there we go, yeah. Ooh, we have, we have hands up. Uh, what what robot or kit was that from uh, Lego, which was there it, if we wanted to grab one as well? So um, this kit here is 42065. It's not the only one that will work. Um, there's another one in the Power Functions Track Vehicle series, which is a little bit cheaper, which might be a good start point. Um, I don't know if anybody follows me on Twitter, but one of the things I was asking before this event was... Does anybody want to uh, buy me one of the newer app-controlled ones so I can hack that and show you how I did that? But no one, no one uh, uh, did that for me. So always happy to reverse engineer the newer ones and um, help you use that as a base for your own things. I, I might have a chat with you later about that. Okay. Let's go do some obstacles. There oh, we go. look at that. Let's just drive it off the, uh, the, sh the shallow step. So there are lots of downsides with this hobby, I have to say. One of them is that your kids are always asking where their Lego is. <laughs> um, another one is that people give you things that are broken. Like you get a collection of half-working Roombas and stuff like that. Um, what's worse than that is that after that happening for a while, you start using them. <laughs> um, I got half of an old washing machine and found a use for that. Um, but, you know, it's fun. It's fun for... Any more questions for Mark? Have you ever have you ever tried like using AI to like um, solving mazes and stuff like that with robots? Not solving mazes, but one of the things I'm doing at the moment is um, using um, image classifiers to decide what the robot should do. So um, I have a little bit of uh, a paddock out the back of my house. And so we find ourselves feeding uh, chickens and cats because they're pets and crows and hedgehogs because they're wildlife and they seem to like us. And what I want to be able to do is to have food for the specific animals, but only dispense the one for the animal that's there. Um, I, I got it working um, for two categories. Um, I'd like to do some more work on it. That's cool. Any more questions for Mark? I'll put all the code for this up on GitHub later. I forgot my uh, um, YubiKey, so I couldn't upload it. And I can't upload it until I get home. Um, <laughs> stupid security. <laughs> um, uh, just a blocker, security. Yeah, just a blocker. Just, yeah, there we go. Right, a round of applause for Mark. <laughs> An even bigger round of applause for the robot. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that was tempting the demo gods only one thing lot. failed right? yeah that was I'm quite impressed with it. <laughs> so for it to it's go probably going to break if I drive stage. it off there <laughs> oh man down it still man down. it still wants to go it still wants to go yeah but, oh dear uh, okie dokie right we will be breaking for lunch now can I ask or remind everybody upstairs there is the sticker stall, lock picking, and the actual vendors and stuff, some of the guys that are sponsored it. So go up and have a chat with them and find out what they do. Uh, make friends with vendors. It's always really useful in later bits of your career. So don't just make friends with the people beside you. Make friends with vendors because they'll give you stuff. Uh, uh, stuff that, you know, you'll then never use. But uh, there's sometimes good stuff. But, uh, yeah, go up, go have a chat with the vendors, meet more people. Uh, I think we've got an hour for lunch, so let's uh, meet back here in about an hour's time. But another round of applause for Mark, who was awesome. <laughs> <laughs>